Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cards and Coffee with Kenny Brown Show. We have with us Brad, uh, my very friendly host, and he's very happy today because, Brad, why don't you show him, show everybody what you have behind you. Can you move your head a little bit? Okay, yeah, I have my fresh new Impact Racing chair. Isn't that awesome? His uh, wife uh, actually purchased that, surprised him, and uh, purchased that for his birthday. And a uh, happy birthday early, Brad. So Thank we you. won't be on air when it's your birthday, but happy birthday. His birthday is July 31st. So happy birthday, Brad. i uh, like to see who's in the audience today. Uh, we have a very special guest. We have Ben O'Connor from Impact Racing. He is going to be on and answering a question that we had last week um, from uh, Wendy Moretz. So we'll be he'll be answering that. Also, I, I forced him into showing some of his products. Uh, he doesn't want to be too salesy. So I said, no, 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 no. We have so many people that want to see your products. So we please show some of your products. So he'll be doing that as well. And he has graciously uh, Give, wants to give away a free pair of Impact Racing Gloves. So if you're tuned in right now, I'll tell you, we'll be announcing it throughout the show, uh, but how to win the free pair is you need to uh, add your name and make sure you type your name in because sometimes I don't see your name in, in the comments. Uh, add your name and also like, uh, give us a little thumbs up or a heart or something. And then uh, at the end of the show, Ben will be choosing the winner. So let's get going. Uh, also, I forgot the most important part. Uh, we're going to be playing a video of Kenny on how to choose the right gear ratio. And we have many requests on that, so we thought we would play that. It's about five minutes, and then we'll have Ben on. So, Brad, you want to play that? Yep. All right, here we go. doesn't seem to be working. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, well, I'm going to over talk uh, Brad while he's getting that uh, prepared. As you know, if you've been with us for a while, we typically have some, kind uh, of some, some track days yeah. and he's taking a uh, uh, 95 Mustang from a uh, live axle to an IRS, which is going to be a really cool car. And he's got a monster motor in it. Anyway, here, here's this question. Let's see. For my Mustang, I don't want to mess with swapping gears between tracks, uh, track to street, street to track, uh, street to autocross, etc. The car is 95 with the KV IRS, a 428 Windsor, Tremec. A TKO 600, 400 horsepower, 500 pounds of torque. What's the best gear of choice? I've been running a 410 for 13 plus years and, and, and uh, running this car, and it's fantastic on the street and autocross, but never had it on open track. And that is the plan for next year. Uh, so, should I stay with a 410 or run the 355? Uh, that came with the IRS center section, or go in the middle of 373. Well, here's here here's the thing. My recommendation is, before you overthink this, you have to drive it on track with the 410 and see how it works. Now, I can tell you that when we we do gearing for uh, race cars, uh, you know, then we we've, we've got like like for David's car out west, it's got the nut four nine inch in it. And it's really easy to change gears. I mean, you just pull the axles out, take all the bolts off, pull the entire assembly out, drop a new one in, and it takes about you know half hour, 45 minutes to do a gear change. Uh, but what we're always looking for in, in, in racing is in fourth gear, which is the one to one ratio. In fourth gear, are always looking for it to be just a tickle under the red line on the longest straightaway. Okay, we'll gear through the the rear end ratio so it's a the just tickling the red line in fourth gear on the longest straightaway. Uh, and that way, if 
if somebody gets a really good run off of you know the previous corner and they get to red line they still have a ways to go you know fifth gear is like 0.8 so it's not that much of a a, a drop so you maintain momentum so that's, that's kind of how we gear it i did uh I need to pull up something here. We did. I did, did a, a chart for David's uh, AIX car. You can actually go online and find these formulas. But this this is for uh, what I'm looking at is the top speed in fourth gear on a Windsor motor, the 6900 RPM. Uh, the uh, now these are little, this is a four nine eight so the number is a little bit different than eight point eight so fourth gear uh, with the uh, three eighty nine is one hundred and thirty nine four four eleven is one hundred and thirty two uh, four twenty nine is one hundred and twenty seven and then fifth gear you can see you got a, a, a pretty big jump in in, in uh, speed but you also Lose a little, just to lose a little bit of mechanical advantage when you go the 8.8. Now, the Windsor with a 6500 RPM, um, it's kind of just everything just drops down a little bit. So for the 389, it's 132 in four, uh, 411 is 125. And then if we're looking at a coyote, uh, a, a coyote. Coyote in fourth gear because you know our track was we could rev to 7900 is like 160 in fourth gear with the 389, 152 with the 410, uh, 145 with the uh, 429. So this this is kind of how we figured it, and we 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 picked. I can't remember which one we picked, but he was estimating what his top speed would be in the tracks. He runs in fourth gear, and we picked the the, the uh, rear end ratio based off of that. Now, I mean, it's pretty simple. You go online, and there's formulas. You just plug in you know, the RPM, the tire diameter, uh, gear ratios, and it, it'll, it'll just spit out some numbers. So that's how we kind of do it with, uh, with race cars. Now... As, as far as, as getting back to Ben's, I think you need to start with the 410 and see where you are. If, if you're on long straightaways because the uh, Windsor's going to not have as, as much of a rev I had no idea what the rev is. I'm going to say 6,500. Uh, if you're, you have to shift from fourth to fifth, he's got a TKO, so hopefully he's got a 0.8 fifth gear. So have to shift from if the long straightaway you have to shift from fourth to fifth. Then you want, might want to drop down to 373, and or just kind of do some calculations and see. Okay, okay, I need to be that this much more speed at the at the end of the straightaway, and then you. Just figure out what kind of gear ratio to run, but the very first thing is just try it. I know, like on our our, uh, our uh, Cobra race cars, uh, the Tremec TKO, TKO with, with the Tremec uh, Magnum XL, we're in uh, four tens with the Cobras, and that seems to work out really, really well. Now with the uh, the ninety and eleven to fourteen Cobras. Uh, we run the the uh, 373s and that works out really well so it just kind of depends on the tracks you run on what are you looking to be want to get your top speed and fourth gear to kind of sync uh with the with the track well hello what did you think of that it's always fun getting some of Kenny's knowledge, and uh, I thoroughly enjoy listening to him. You know, kind of uh, sad sometimes, but it's actually kind of heartwarming too. Uh, and he always has so much to share. I want to say a few, 
kind of a few people here. Jay Meyer uh, from Buffalo, New York, Fred Francher, Louisville. We just saw you this past week, uh, Fred. Uh, look at Brad. You see how many people are saying happy birthday to you? If you were late for the show, oh, Brad, let me see your coffee mug there. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, I do. So that's this, kind this of our is my, right is, now. This so. is my Kitty Brown Signature Series coffee mug. And so I made this at home. And if you want one, we can make some for you too. <laughs> so, anyway, this, that's, that's, that's our next project we're working on. This is a new product sneak peek. And see, it even has the logo on there. I don't know if you can see it now. Yeah, it's got the signature on the other side as well. So, how cool is that? That is that is really awesome. Um, so, we, we that's the next product we're working on. Kenny was working on it with us, and so we're just continuing that on. Again, we're continuing a lot of things on in the company that he was working on. So it, it's kind of refreshing, and it's great to carry on his legacy. It looks like uh, Joe from Humble. Uh, Texas and Rory, it's good to see you. Chris Smith, those office chairs are awesome. Well, Chris, just wait. Uh, you see that Brad has one behind him, um, but uh, Ben brought one in to show you today, and it's really comfortable. I sat on it. It's it's firm, yet comfortable. It's a really nice seat, uh, sitting chair. So uh, we'll be showing that in a few minutes. Um, I wanted to make an another announcement in case you joined us a little bit late. Uh, ben has graciously decided to give us give away a set of um, racing gloves. So if you would like to win those, put your name in the comment with the name Impact. So we know that that's what you're you're uh, trying to win that. And then also give us a thumbs up. So we, we need some of those thumbs up and then you will be entered in the contest and we will be announcing the winner of the Impact Racing Gloves at the end of this program. Um, I'm going to be introducing um, Ben right now, and the first thing he's going to do is answer a question that you guys have. Um, then I'll have you step in with me. How's that sound? Here's Ben. How are we so, doing? If you guys have been with the program before, you've seen Ben on here. He's, he's one of our most popular uh, guests, and so we thought we'd have him again. We have. <laughs> We have so many people that request they want to see the products. And typically, you know, Kenny would show some products and talk tech. Uh, that's exactly what Ben's going to be doing. He'll be showing you some of the products. Uh, we have high requests for that, so we thought we would oblige and do that. And again, uh, you don't know how you're going to choose the, the person that wins the gloves yet, do you? No. So we'll be announcing that at the end. It will be here. random. Yes, it will be random. I'm going to tell him how to, how to choose. So... Uh, at the end of the show, make sure you put your name and the word impact in the comments and then give us a like and you'll be entered in the contest to win those gloves. Well, without further ado, oh, I wanted to say one more thing. So the question that the first question that Ben is answering is from Wendy Moritz and she asked this and thought we should cover it. So we are. So remember, if you want us to cover anything on, on upcoming programs, put it in the comments or give us a call. And if you want any kind of fu any future guests, please put it in the comments. We look at all those and we will take note of it and see what we can do. Well, without further, oh, I didn't mean that, tell you who you were. Ben, <laughs> he's a good friend and he has, he's been in the industry for years and years and has a ton of knowledge. So without further ado, please uh, give Ben a warm. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> take care, Ben. Try not to flub this up too bad. Uh, hello, everybody. I believe the question is regarding SFI um, in terms of uh, a counterfeit product. Uh, here about two weeks ago, SFI had sent out a notification to all the manufacturers uh, stating that there were a couple of companies. There was one particular company, and about a week later, they followed up with another one uh, that was producing uh, SFI counterfeit labels. The product still wasn't counterfeit. It was their product. Um, but they were counterfeiting SFI labels. And what that means is that um, SFI, we back up a little bit, uh, SFI is a foundation dedicated to testing and validating certain aspects of safety equipment in terms of safety. So in this particular case, these were, they were driving suits. And when you validate, test, homologate through SFI, 
uh, they give you approval and then they sell you the, the SFI tags. You have to buy them through them and then you would sew those affixes onto the product that you're selling, whether that's shoes or gloves or suits or whatever that might be. And what had happened was this uh, company, I won't say the name of the company, it's not my place to do this. I'll, I'll give you guys some resources towards the end here that you can use to, to look this stuff up. But what was happening is they were just producing their own SFI tags in their own garments and then selling them as SFI proof. Now, the company may or may not have even known what SFI does. It was a foreign company. Um, and, and we see this a lot of times where companies will just copy products and they don't really know what they're copying or why or whatever, but they copy everything. So in this particular case, they were being shipped over with uh, SFI tags. So one of the things that you, know, you want to talk about is you want to make sure whatever product you're buying, whether it's ours or anybody else's, you, you want to make sure that it meets the criteria, the safety criteria that it claims it does. And, and the only way you really know that is if uh, by choosing a garment that is either SFI, uh, FIA is, a, is another one, uh, or Snell in the case of, of helmets. And all of these three organizations, SFI, FIA, and uh, Snell have resources on their own websites. Anybody can go to their websites. Uh, and I don't know the other two, but SFI is simply sfifoundation.com. And within there, you can search manufacturers and even specific products to make sure that the, the garment or product that you're looking at meets that criteria. So if you were to go to SFI and you, you can down tab impact and you say, look at our, you know, our, our racer suit, right? And it's got, you know, the SFI label on it uh, right here on the sleeve, right? But we put that on, right? So you can look that up and then determine that or, or validate, confirm that, okay, yeah, that does meet SFI testing uh, protocols and, and homologation, right? So uh, it, it's real important. Obviously, you want to make sure that whatever you're buying meets those specifications because sometimes not every sanctioned body is savvy to all the different manufacturers out there so it is possible that you could buy a garment that doesn't meet these standards uh, which obviously is, is, could be dangerous uh show up at a sanctioning event a sanctioned event and they may let you go just because they don't know they see the, the tag and they go okay whatever right it's, it's got an sfi tag you're good to go um, but you want to make sure yourself that, you know, due diligence, you want to make sure that, that the garment that you're using meets the, the specifications. So uh, that's real important. Uh, the other thing is you can look in different places and products. Like I just showed you a jacket, the SFI tag there's on, on the sleeve. That, that's a pretty common place. Um, helmets, um, Snell and uh, Snell, SFI and FI all tend to do it. But the most common one is Snell. Like in our helmet, you'll see the hard to see in the lighting here, but there's a Snell tag back there in the back of the helmet. You can pull the, pull the padding down, right? And that'll tell you what iteration of specification it is too, like Snell. Um, uh, Snell every five years changes the specifications of, of the helmet requirements. The idea being that uh, conceivably each iteration of helmet is safer than the last. Now, SFI, um, with their garments in particular, they haven't really changed those specifications in a number of years. You have SFI, um, uh, uh, you know, there's one, five, uh, 15, and 10, 15, and 20. The most common are going to be one, five, uh, 15, and 20. Um, but they haven't really changed those in years. So uh, the helmets are the one you really got to look out for. And a lot of sanctioned bodies will require you to update to a newer standard helmet every every five years. Most typically they'll let you run uh, usually the current Snell or prior. So that's 10 years minimally, sometimes up to 11. They'll give you a one year grace period to replace it. Um, but uh, anyways, so that's that. You want to make sure that what you're buying is there are resources out there. Like I said, check FIA if it's an FIA product uh, or if it's a sanctioning body you're running with requires you to run FIA. Uh, Snell for, for most helmets. Uh, and then, uh, uh, like I said, SFI is going to govern mostly everything, but mostly suits, gloves, shoes, and, and things like that. So uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions.
questions on, on any of that, I, I can open up the floor to that if anybody's got anything they want to ask. No? Are we good? It takes just a, there's a delay um, in um, getting the comments. So what we will do is we will announce the, the impact giveaway today. So we are having, uh, Ben has decided to give us away a set of impact racing gloves. So if you'd like to enter, uh, please put your name and the word impact in the comments and then give, give us some uh, thumbs up and you'll be interest, interest, uh, entered. And then um, we will be announcing the winner at the very end of the show. So let's see if there's any questions. Brad, do you see any questions in there? Not yet. So uh, Ben, well, as we, why don't you, go ahead. I said, okay. No okay, why don't you continue on? Yeah, we will, uh, with that, we'll segue into gloves. Let's, let's talk about gloves. So uh, we manufacture three different types of gloves, you know, Break it down here. I'll just show these real quick. This is uh, this is our G6 glove. It's the one we'll be giving away. We've got our Axis glove and then our Alpha glove. So the G6 glove. This is rated the 3285 again uh, rating, so that uh, you can use this most form of motor sports. All of these are, are rated five gloves, and again, they have SFI 15s and 20s, but those are typically used for drag racing, uh, top alcohol, top fuel. Uh, all the stuff that we'll be talking about today is going to be more oriented toward road racing or lower class uh, drag racing and off road things like that. Um, so it's an SFI glove. It is an internal stitch glove, which is, means it's, it's sewn. In the inside, right? They sew it inside out, then they turn it, flip it out, and they're done. That's a pretty traditional way of making gloves. Almost all the gloves that we've seen in our everyday life are, are manufactured that way. Uh, it has leather on both palms in, and fingers. Thin, so you still have some good tactile feel, but the leather really helps uh, assist a little bit of grip, but also uh, increases the, the wear rating of the glove as, as well. So that's the glove that we're going to be giving away today. Um, lucky viewer there. The next glove is going to be our access glove. So as we step it up, what we talk about are things in terms of ergonomics and comfort uh, and then uh, uh, increased tactile feel. So the access glove is externally stitched. So you can see the stitching you know, on the outside of the glove. And don't really know the origins of that. They've been around a number of years now. But I suspect. I'm going to interrupt you because yeah. it's really hard to see your gloves here because of the lighting. Do you want to step over here and I'll pass you product? Hey, oh, okay. All right. Yep, yeah, that sounds we're, good. We're being impromptu here. So um, we have better lighting over here. We're having a little bit of difficulty with our set because it's so dark. So it keeps everything else dark. So, so anyway, we're putting the camera, camera on and then we'll continue on. All right. Good. All right. So again, you know, again, you have the leather in both palms and fingers there. Uh, for increased wear resistance. External stitch, and the reason, I think it was, you know, originally, so we don't really know the origins, but I have a feeling that it was probably a, a mistake at some point. Somebody probably sewed one uh, the, the wrong way inside out, and they went to flip around like, oh my God, yeah, this thing's inside out. But what they realize is by keeping the stitching on the outside, it makes for more comfortable uh, look because it's not bunching up on the inside of the glove. Now, that's not to say that the first glove I showed you, the G6, there is uncomfortable. It's actually a very, very, very comfortable glove, but this just takes that up another notch. So then from there, we go to our Alpha glove, and this is, uh, this is our top of the line glove. Okay, again, external stitch. It has silicon embossed fingertips, again, for increased grip and very light tactile feel so that the driver vehicle interface is, is really greatly enhanced with the glove like this, right? And, you know, anytime we talk about driving, performance driving, that connectivity, that interface between the driver and the uh, vehicle is really critical. So the better feel you have, the better control you have, the better your, your driving is going to be. But the other difference between this glove is that uh, it's pre-curved, meaning that before they sew it, it's it's patterned in such a way that it naturally wants to curl up, and that helps reduce the bunching up on the inside of the fingers. 
So again, all helps increase that. These are available in three different colors, black, white, and then of course, neon yellow. Neon yellow is, is somewhat of a trend in, in style, we're seeing that, but it also has some safety benefits to it as well for signaling. Uh, if you want to do a wave by, right, a yellow glove is pretty easy to see. If you need to signal somebody from inside the car, uh, very easy to see. So we're starting to see it used more and more in all sorts of motorsports just based on the safety aspect of being able to see the glove. So uh, there's that. Uh, talk about a roller bag real quick since we're here. Uh, as the name, as I just said, roller bag, it's got a set of well, wheels there, telescoping handle. Uh, this thing just has a ton of space in it. A lot of different compartments. We've got a padded compartment here for, for helmets. You can you can actually put three helmets in here if you want, or a couple helmets. You've got a place for your shoes, gloves, gear. There you've got a separate compartment up here on top that uh, you can move this divider around. Right? So you can different things. You put your, maybe your suit up here or your, your street clothes if you uh, and we need a place to store those while you're while you're on track. You've got some, you know, banded mesh uh, deal here, maybe for your, uh, you know, after uh, after track uh, sock use here. And you want to air, air them out a little bit to so have somewhere to put it, pocket for your uh, maybe your wallet or something like that. Um, you know, external pockets here. These travel uh, pretty good. They'll, they'll go on most uh, airlines will take these without any issues. So they're good for rug use other than just maybe your safety gear. So, uh, you want something else while we're here? Mm -hmm. uh, right now, yeah, just let's, I'm just going to jump into these sure. and then we'll, yeah. Perfect. Right? So this is a, a balaclava. And, you know, even in maybe where you're not required to use a balaclava, it's really a good idea. It is it's just an extra layer of, uh, of fire protection, fire resistance protection. Uh, is obviously underneath the, the helmet and on the head there. But one of the challenges with a, a lot of the traditional balaclavas is they have a single eye port or dual eye port, and it covers the entire face and nose. And that's not really problematic for most short-term races, but in an endurance racing situation, if you have a drink system or something like that, that can be problematic because you literally have to pull it all the way down, stretch it out underneath your chin. It's very uncomfortable. With this, it allows you to just move that up and down easily so that you can access a drink system or, or even a, a bite to eat or something like that. Question on the, the FIA ratings. Mm -hmm. That's for fire protection, correct? Yeah, they, they cover they cover helmets and also fire ratings as well. And that's what's yeah. important as far as the protection on the the baklava and the, the, the suits and all is yeah correct correct yeah and they've also had different standards just like sfi does as well so and, and again great resource you can go to their website and they can you can find all that stuff on there it's just a wealth of information sfi i've spent a lot of time on the sfi website because 95 percent of the product could be sfi homologated we don't do a lot of fi homologation uh, we have a couple products, but, but most of our stuff is SFI. Um, but there's just there is a wealth of information on there beyond just if you want to know if a manufacturer's you know product meets a specification or whatever. But there's a ton of stuff on there for uh, tracks, safety crews, um, you know, obviously drivers. Um, just a lot of really really good information. So if you ever want to get schooled up on on automotive safety, motorsport safety, it's a great resource. Um, not that this is a safety related <laughs> product, but uh, as they, they, Terry mentioned earlier with Brad, uh, our new uh, office gaming chair there that we just introduced here this month and uh, fully featured uh, uh, gaming and office chair, a little bit different. You'll find your typical gaming and, and office chairs on the market there. The foam is a little bit stiffer, but yet compliant and offers good support. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've always noticed when you buy an office chair, uh, just run to the mill office chair or any of those for that matter, they it's tend you tend to be sitting, it's like sitting on a on a board. The foam is really thin, it's really mushy. I mean, as soon as you sit down, you blow right through it. These, because they're based on the same technology and actually some of the same components as an actual driving seat, 
right? You don't have that. There's no wood bottom to this seat. It's got a bit of a suspension on it, and you can see it's a good pivot there, right? It's really cool. You got a, got a good amount of recline. It doesn't recline as much as an automotive seat no, because you don't have to tip over backwards, but you've like got a, quite a bit of range there. Yeah, it feels right. like an automotive seat that. versus yeah. uh, an office chair. Yep. And it also has the adjustable lumbar, okay. which is, again, I mean, I said it's up a little bit higher right here. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Does and then have... the... Uh, that's really nice. Yeah. And then the armrests are for the adjustable. You can move up and down and also forward and back so you get the position just right where you want it. But, uh, and like I said, and a, and a little bit of a uh, lumbar support there for those wild excursions in the office or maybe those hallway uh, office made the drag races. Double <laughs> extra support there. Right? That would be awesome. What, what I like about an office red one, you have black and Yeah, red. yeah, we do black with a little bit of white trim, but mostly black and then the uh, black in here with the red trim. I really liked about this was the price point. Yeah, yeah, three hundred fifty dollars, um, which you know for a high end office chair is, is yeah. pretty competitive. Well, as far, I, as far I've been as looking at high end office chairs, and this this is I like this better. Yeah, so, of course, the increase too. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right, for sure. Um, we can talk about shoes. Shoes. Some right okay. here, and there's two more here. So same same kind of concept, you know, the good, better, best, or different features, I guess, is probably a better way to put it, because this shoe is actually our least expensive shoe, but it's also our most popular, and for good reason. Uh, this is the uh, Axis shoe. Again, these all meet the SFI 5 requirement there. Right, you've got a Velcro latch there, high top for good protection and support. Um, Wrap around sole, like a lot of your, and we'll get into this a little bit, the different types of soles, still thin, thin enough. So you've got, again, you've got that good tactile feel. You've got good support for heel toe uh, if you're doing that. But this shoe really, because of the, the, the tread and the, the way that the uh, sole's designed, is a really good um, combination, you know, driving and pit use, right? A lot of the really pure driving shoes are not very comfortable to walk around in. Uh, and especially, you know, in most of the pits that you'll find at most racetracks aren't paved. And a lot of times they may be in the gravel or, or grass and rocks and things like that. So some of those shoes can be pretty uncomfortable. This is a great shoe for that. Uh, the drivers working on their own vehicle, maybe they don't have time in between, you know, rounds to, to go completely change and do what they need to do and then get back in the car for the next session and, and put the shoes back on. That's a great shoe. You can walk around in it all day, uh, be comfortable, and then have that protection you need when you're on track and also have a good good heel toe. Super, super popular in uh, off-road because it's rugged enough where they can hike out if they need to. So, um, From there, we're looking at the Alpha shoe. Now, the Alpha shoe, it's a lighter shoe. It's a little thinner and just lighter overall. But again, you look at the, you can look at the sole here. It's pretty, pretty thin. All right, so you're not going to get a lot of uh, support that way and side support things. So you know, I said off track, you're going to you're going to feel more of that stuff, but it's still thicker than a lot of say pure driving shoe, which we'll get to next. But that's just a good lightweight shoe, mid mid height. Uh, again, good flexibility, good heel toe capability with that one. Uh, the Phenom shoe is our this is our top of the line shoe. So you've got a pulse chaff skin finish so it doesn't uh, to maybe help keep it from getting you know dirty and whatever, maybe mud or something like that. Again, if you're walking around the pits or whatever. But uh, again, really, really thin sole. The sole really was designed purely as a, as a pure driving shoe. That's not to say you can't wear the pits, but it's not really designed for that. It really was designed to be more of just a, an absolute driving shoe. Very, very lightweight, perforation for good breathing. Excellent support, um, you know, a little bit stiffer. It's not going to move around as much that way. Again, it'll really assist that, that heel toe. The Velcro latch with the laces there to adjust it. And you make that shoe in a, there's a black and then a, a white version. This is a new shoe for us this year, actually a redesign. We completely redesigned that shoe. Pretty, pretty snazzy looking shoe there. 
far as that goes. Um, from there, we can talk about, uh, let's grab that jacket real quick. Let's talk real quick about that. I, a lot of, you know, when running open track, there's a lot of sanctioning bodies or open track coordinators and whatnot may not require you to wear uh, FR protection, fire rated protection. Uh, but it's always a good idea, obviously. The flames aren't any cooler in a, in a gas-powered Mustang than they are in, a, in an Indy car. <laughs> Fire's fire, right? And, and I know I'm going to get some, some comments and feedback about that. Well, did you use a pop hole versus it? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Uh, it, it's hot. And any of them can cause severe injury. So it's always a good idea to wear some, some fire protection. Anytime you're on track, I think, anytime you're in a track environment, you should be wearing a helmet, you should be wearing some sort of fire protection. Uh, and one of the things that people will do if it's not required, and while I strongly suggest you wear a pants and jacket, um, is maybe to minimally wear just the jacket, or wear a pant and jacket, and then when you have a car, you can, again, you can take the jacket off, leave the pants on while you're in pit doing what you need to do, and then next session you can throw the jacket back on. That way you're not stuck in the suit all day long. Now check your sanctioned bodies. Uh, if you're competing, they may not allow a two-piece suit. Most of them don't, I don't believe, in, in road racing, but uh, for open track, you know, that's uh, open track days and things like that. That's a that's a great option for you. This is our racer jacket here. Again, that's rated SFI 328F5, 3.285, right? Good thin two layer, nice comfortable inner liner, uh, nice lightweight design. And this isn't even our lightest suit, but this is a, a really lightweight suit. Suit, the textile industry has really advanced a lot in the last 10 years. You're going to find that the suit that you would buy today is considerably less uh, or considerably lighter than what you would have bought even, even 10 years ago. It's pretty amazing that way and still meeting the same requirements in terms of um, uh, FR ratings. So they're uh, helmets, I think, right? Yep. Do you want to in any order? Yeah, I think it doesn't really matter. Just bring them out, I guess. I'll throw them up here and then I can just grab them when you need them. So this is the, this is our 1320 helmet. Uh, the one I used to show where the Snell label was. This is a fiberglass helmet. So it's kind of, I guess, for lack of a better term, an entry-level helmet, although it's fully featured in terms of, you know, shield mechanisms, the interior. This is the same, we use the same interior same fabric, very soft, plush, supple uh, helmet interior on all of our helmets, regardless of its, you know, the, the you know, four hundred ninety nine dollar, three hundred ninety nine. Sorry, uh, you know, fiberglass thirteen twenty helmet here, or you know, our, our carbon fiber helmets. So you always get that same benefit of having that really soft, comfortable interior. So they are really, really comfortable helmets to wear. This is an air version. We offer this helmet air and not air. All the helmets I'm going to show today, we offer them uh, both ways. Um, something not typically used for track days, but it is used in, in road racing and uh, certainly other forms of motorsports and off-road and things like that is forced air. Uh, there are a ton of options available now in terms of forced air uh, pumps and things like that. We, we don't do one ourselves, but there are several companies that do. Um, I got to tell you, once you've done it, once you've ran a helmet with forest air, especially in the summertime when it's hot, um, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll ask yourself why you never did it. It's, it's really a great experience. It keeps the, helps keep the shield from fogging, keeps any dust that might get in there out, but it really helps cool the, cool the driver as well. Air on our helmets comes in on the top channeled through the inside of the helmet and, uh, and that's uh, that's a patent we own the patent on that uh, directs the air internally through these channels right here above above the shield so that really helps with the breathability and again keeping keeping your face cool and things like that the kind of step up from that is going to be this is this is the vapor uh, again, this fiberglass helmet, we actually made the fiberglass helmet in the, this is the 1320, the Champ, uh, Champ PT, sorry, and then the uh, Charger. These will all be fiberglass helmets that we manufactured. Uh, going up further, we get into our carbon Kevlar. So as the name would imply, it's got some carbon and Kevlar matting elements to it. It's actually got some other stuff in there. It's a true composite helmet. It has several different materials, but primarily carbon and, and Kevlar. And that's done to keep the, the weight down. 
so you can make a little bit thinner shell, maintain that, that strength structure that you need. Same plush interior. And then we offer this, again, just like this one, a couple different uh, eye ports. We have a, a tall eye port in the draft series, and then the vapor series have a narrow eye port. The uh, ET, or the Champ ET and the Champ, which I didn't bring here, also has a nose bridge type. I think a lot of people are familiar with, kind of a dark Vader looking helmet. Really common in drag racing. Uh, the design really helps you focus on the, on the lights of Christmas tree. But most of these other ones, they all have really good peripheral vision. Obviously, that's important. Any type of driving you might be doing, you're kind of wondering what's going on next to you. That's super important. And then it's really just a personal preference, whether you want uh, a lot of uh, visual or, or a little bit less. Some people, if you're a little bit claustrophobic, you know, going to a helmet with a larger shield can really help with that quite a bit. Uh, one other helmet I want to show uh, before, we, before we finish here. This is an SA2015 helmet. So this is actually a helmet that we are, uh, that we discontinued. But I wanted to show it and let everybody know that we, we have these on clearance. This is actually a really nice, good, lightweight helmet. This is also a carbon Kevlar helmet. Got a center detent design there. And it's not quite the same interior as we do in the other helmets. We don't be straight up on, so we don't manufacture this helmet in house. All these other helmets, um, with the exception of this one, and there's one, two others. We do a over-the-wall crew helmet that we don't manufacture, and then we do a recreational play car helmet that we don't that we don't build in house. But all the rest that we manufacture right here in Indianapolis, Indiana, and even the supplies and components and a lot of things we get are U.S. based, and in many cases even Indiana based. So we really are truly a uh, U.S. manufacturer when it comes to uh, helmets and most of the stuff that we do, really. But uh, what's Neat about this helmet, it's a good helmet. This is, we have these at Snell and FIA, so if you do need an FIA homologated helmet. And uh, we're offering this on clearance right now for, for $300 a piece. This helmet is normally $750, so it's an exceptional value uh, for a lightweight carbon Kevlar uh, type helmet. Uh, SA 2015 is the last homologation, it's not the most current one, but most sanctioned bodies will allow you to run uh, an SA 2015 helmet through at least 2025, and a lot of them through 2026. Again, they'll kind of give you that extra year. But check with your sanctioned body. Uh, but for track days, you may not even need any particular uh, homologation. Uh, it's a good, lightweight, safe helmet that you could use uh, for those applications. So I'll tell you right now, we're out of large. Um, I just checked before you came here. There were a couple left in stock, but I know they're spoken for. But these helmets run a little on the large side. We do have a medium large that is a smaller shell as well. Um, we've got plenty of those. So if you normally would wear a large helmet, I would suggest uh, just uh, going with one of those unless you barely fit in a large. But if you're, you know, large is a little bit on the loose side to you, uh, to middle range, that, that medium large would work really, really well. We have plenty of extra large, double extra large, small, mediums left in stock as well. So again, that's an exceptional value for, uh, for a carbon Kevlar helmet. I think that's it for the stuff I bought. Um, well, I'm going to interrupt you. So I'm going to um, throw you for a loop here, too. Our cameraman today has been Rich Cottrell. <laughs> and Rich, why don't you sit in that chair? I want to say a little something. So, uh, Ben, we're really excited about this chair. And Rich was mentioning that he needed a new chair. And what did, what did you tell him, Ben? So, it, you know, I told Rich that if he sold 10 of these, then I would give him one. So the number one reason you should buy these chairs is so Rich gets a new chair. So get everything else he said so Rich gets a new chair. Spin, spin around, Rich. Let's see the back of it. Kind of show the whole product up. It's almost like a home shopping network. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's good. And so, for office racing. Yeah, they were. Exactly. They scoot. Yeah, and they, yeah, they but anyway, so that, that's our inside a little joke here in the company is, and Rich is trying hard to send, uh, sell 10 of them. So anyway, I know they just came out, I think this week, didn't they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we just, just got, we just started shooting. Okay. We, yeah. Last week, I think. So, yeah. And that's cool. Yeah, so is this the glove that. Is this the one? Yeah. This is it. Okay. So again, this is the glove that, um, 
event is going to, uh, some, some lucky winner is going to win this glove. So, and in order, I'll announce it again. What you need to do is put in the comments your name and the word impact, and then also like, add a little thumbs up um, on the page, and you will be entered, and he will be uh, picking the lucky winner here in, right after the Q&A. So if you have any questions for Ben, please uh, put them in the comments. And Brad, are you going to be uh, reading some of the questions there? I hope yeah, so. I'll be happy questions. to read the questions. And I had a couple of questions on my own too, so. Okay, there we go. You're muted, Carrie. Okay, there we go. So Brad, you have a few questions first? Yeah, so I know uh, I do. Let me scroll back up a minute and I'll hit the um, questions from the viewers. Um, and we had a couple of good ones, so let me just find them. Bear with me here a second. Yeah, there were some really good questions here. So Okay, so um, we had a Facebook user, so I can't see their name, but the question was, for the three gloves reviewed, is there a difference in fire protection rating, or are they all the same? Yeah, those, the three gloves that we're talking about today are, are all the same. Uh, it's the QA5 standard through SF5. They do make higher rated gloves, but typically you would only use those again for uh, alcohol, drag racing, or top fuel. Uh, they have an SF5 15 and a 20. We don't do a 15, we do a, we do a 20 uh, glove that, that, that's available. Okay, and then so the next question is from Chris Smith, and this is a great question. Are there any gloves that you have that you can use on an iPad or a GPS system, uh, for instance, in off-road racing when the co-driver is navigating? Yeah, I actually, I, I'm glad that you brought that up and I just realized that I forgot to bring that glove. Our Phenom glove has touchscreen capability. Uh, it is um, very similar to the, to the Alpha glove. That I showed you there. It is also pre curved external stitch uh, with the silicon in both fingertips, but it does have a special pad on, I want to say on the, on the pointer finger and maybe the blue on the thumb, I think, but definitely on the pointer finger that allows it to be used with uh, um, devices like that. So you could use that with a cell phone or with a Garmin device or with the, um, the type of screens that we use. Uh, in off-road racing, so pr pretty much anything that has a touch screen, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, and I've actually played around with it even on my phone and had some pretty good results uh, that way. I was, I was surprised that, you know, I'm fat fingered to begin with, so you throw a glove on and it really makes it bad, but, but I was able, you know, even on my cell phone, able to type out, you know, literate <laughs> <laughs> and words there with the glove, so I was pretty impressed with that. They, they worked pretty good. You know, it's like anything else. There's a uh, you, you got to get kind of get the hang of it, and find the spot on the you know on the book to do that. But you know, for other stuff, most navigation systems, things like that, you got a little bit more room to to work around with that. Where certain if you want to pinch and uh, pinch zoom things like that, it's you know very easy to do that kind of stuff. So uh, it works really well for that. And cool. so, engine control systems too. And there's a lot of the, uh, you know, I think we've Motec and some of the other ones also have on screen capability now uh, where we've, we've got guys and even in drag racing, maybe they'll do some you know, some changes before a pass, maybe they're working on an index run or something like that. And when they dial something in, they, they can do that. So. Okay, cool. So um, Dylan, uh, who's one of our Speed Therapy Academy alumni members, he asked, what are the main differences from the original Phenom shoe and the new 2.0 Phenom? The, the redesign really is more styling. Yeah, the shoes are, are, are the same as far as that goes you know, in terms of features and construction. There, there was really no change there. Uh, we, we made a little bit of improvement on the, on the very bottom uh, sole, the traction part of the sole. We changed that a tiny, tiny bit, but nothing that's uh, in terms of visuals. 
we had some some delamination where the logo was kind of in these extreme use situations that we addressed and, uh that's what actually is even addressed in the older older shoe uh before this one came out but but we want to make sure we, that we revise that make sure everything's good as far as that goes but yeah it's mostly just uh, the design thing Okay, so next we have uh, Walter. I'm going to interrupt you, uh, Brad. So again, this is your last call to enter the uh, contest to win the uh, free pair of uh, Impact Racing Gloves. So put your name in the comment and uh, a little like, thumbs up, and put the word impact in the comment. So your name, the word impact, and give us a thumbs up. And you'll be entered. We're going to be calling that winner shortly. Okay, so um, the next question is from Joe Johnson, who's another alumni member. His question is, does Impact Racing, uh, do your helmets, all of your helmets come with anchors for a head and neck restraint or a Hans device or the Stan 21 Club 3 device? Yeah, all, any helmet, any SA 2015 or... Uh, 8059 2015 and an FIA uh, manufacturer starting in 2015 mandatory has to have the uh, the anchor points built into the helmet the the, uh, the threaded instrument right now so ours doesn't come with the the FIA mandates that it has to actually be a Hans post which really stinks for running something other than the Hans but um, but that Snell only dictates that it has to have this threaded insert, right? So, and it's common between all the manufacturers, they standardize that as well, it's an M6 uh, thread fit. So whatever device you buy on the market will be compatible with any of the SA2015, SA2020 helmets. You just you screw right on, even if you had an older helmet, you want to switch it over, you just unscrew the hardware and screw it on the helmet, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Um, so Bill Haney, uh, has a question. Um, do fire suits have an expiration date? So that, that's an excellent question. It depends on the series and the type of suit. So uh, SFI through working, I guess, with NHRA has mandated that every five years, their SFI through to a 15 and 20 suits need to be inspected by the manufacturers and, and to be eligible for recertification. Now, not every manufacturer offers that service. We do, uh, but in, in majority of them do, but not all of them. Um, where you'd send it back to manufacturer, you'd expect it, make sure everything's good, and you know, fix new labels to it, and, and then you're, you're good for another five years. And of course, there are restrictions and limitations to that. But anyways, it's basically how it works. On the SFI fives, and I'm not sure about tens. Nobody makes a ten suit. It's a, it's a, and nobody even requires it that I'm aware of. It's a, a spec that an SFI has listed, but I don't know of anybody that's ever required it or used it. But anyways, any of the SFI fives, which is 90% of the suits you're going to run into out there, and 90% of the sanctioning bodies out there are going to require. Like I said, the only time you ever see a requirement on 15s or 20s is usually NHRA or ITRA, some NMCA, some of these other. Uh, drag racing, but in drag racing, when you're running, you know, uh, alcohol, power adders, uh, or, or nitromethane, right? Almost everywhere else, they're going to re they require an SFI 5, uh, typically, and sometimes they'll even allow you a 1, which is the lowest minimum standard, which I still wouldn't recommend anybody doing if you're going to do it. Please get yourself a good you know, SFI 5 rated suit. Um, so that's that's the majority of it. So yeah, there are and those don't need to be recertified because they like said that the standard hasn't changed since they initially announced that that standard. And if they ever did change the standard, it would just be a different SFI rating. It wouldn't be an SFI five, it'd be a six or whatever, right? And it would just be a different suit. You couldn't couldn't up certify it or whatever anyway. So um, but those suits to, to date don't need to be recertified or inspected. So I'm going to bump in here. It's time to announce the winner. All right. And the way you're going to do it is uh, 26 people followed the instructions and added their comments and liked it. So you get to pick a number between 1 and 26, and that is the winner. 
All right. Do you have a number? Number one. Number one. Okay, that's easy for us. First okay. game. Okay, we'll continue answering questions, and uh, Rich will tally to see who the first person was, and he'll come in and give us the name. All, All right. right. Very good. Well, I, I know who the first person was, so I'm super happy You're to see. Not included. I'm, I'm super happy to see them win. So um, I, know, I know who that first person is. So uh, we, we do have another question that's a, a great question. Let me uh, put you back on in your solo layout. Um, let's see. It, this is from a Facebook user, so I can't see their name, but th this is a great question and I'll add to it. What do you recommend for cleaning gloves and fire suits. And so I know that there's a chemical that you can use to wash um, your racing apparel that works really well. And I, the name of the product escapes me, but um, I've used it before and it'll clean up a driving suit or a pair of gloves pretty easy. So do you, do you know anything about yeah, that? I, I, don't, I don't remember the name of it either. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's super, super expensive, but you get a lot of washes out of it. Um, basically, you want to stay away from, you know, color fast detergent detergent you can wash it your washing machine cold gentle cycle uh try to stay away said like i said stay away from um uh, you know color fast type type products although it would be a little bit difficult to do um and hang dry it. the number one thing is don't don't dry the things you can cook them they will shrink it's just like a you know like cotton and other products uh, of that fibrous nature like that it, it does have a tendency to shrink um so you don't want to do that and you just don't want to cook cook the suit although with nomax um which uh, all but our our paddock suits are the uh, they call pro band or cotton you know treated uh fabric that's a very entry level suit there that we don't really recommend for driving because of the comfort aspect of it. it's a great through suit but um all our other suits are true nomax so it's not like you can wash out the protective properties of, of Nomex. That's the good thing about it. But, um, but you do, you know, they are susceptible to shrinkage. So you got to be careful with that. So we don't recommend it. Particularly if you have a custom suit with certain types of graphics, some we use heat transfers and things like that, that would really be affected by the, by the drying cycle. But um, really just gentle wash, and you can do that. A wool wipe works really good. That's still a, a good standard. You can want to hand wash them uh, in the sink and we'll like hang dry them. Uh, that's a really good way to go. We wash suits all the time when they come in for, for alterations and things like that. And we just, that's how we do it. We just wash them in a, in a washing machine, cold cold cycle, and uh, laundry detergent, and then hang them in the dry. Okay, so that's it information the name of the product um that i've used in the past for gloves and for driving suits is called molecule and oh yeah, so it's, molecule. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's made by a company called molecule molecule sports um i did place a link uh in the comment section for anybody who's interested in that product and like ben said it's um it's quite expensive but it is the best product on the market and the only thing i've found that'll actually clean the suits take stains out um right. and, and, and not and not wash the color out right it keeps the color really well too i uh got a couple of drivers professional drivers that have had you know suits of ours custom suits that have had them for uh, you know several years and they still look new using that so now i've heard very very good things about it Yep, great. So um, I don't think we, we don't have any more questions from the gallery. Um, I, I had a question um, that was it goes back to the um, to the safety and the and the labeling so that the SFI Foundation has a dedicated testing facility. I believe it's in California. Yeah, probably California. Yeah, so you can, the manufacturers will submit their products to the SFI. SFI will test it. They'll certify it um for safety um but how how does the fia um because the fia is is another um i guess they have they have their own safety labels how, how do they test their products do they have their own facility or do they use a uh, somebody I, I, you know, I don't know if they have their own facility or not but i do know that it's typically done through a third party okay so I'm authorized just, I'm... laboratories throughout the world that you can use to do the validation testing then you submit those results to fia 
And I believe yeah. SFI, SFI in power is one of those. <laughs> They'll actually do that for certain products and do that kind of testing. So, so I'm guessing probably TUV would be the organization that they use to test for the SF uh, or for FIA. Well, I think again TUV. I want to, if I'm not mistaken, is a standard. I don't think that's a. I, I, I don't know. Okay. That, that's more you know automotive uh, over the road type stuff, I believe. Yeah, and we we were talking about the SFI Foundation, and I did put a link in the comments earlier that'll take you to the SFI Foundation's uh, page where they um, they upload notices. And so if, if anybody um, is looking at a safety product, you can always go to the SFI Foundation's website, follow the link I sent. Um, there'll be a notice in there if a product has been tested and failed or is a counterfeit um, or has a fake um, label um i don't know about the the fia and in, in terms of labels it seems like it's it's pretty difficult to distinguish between a real label and a fake label because from an appearance standpoint they look the same but di dimensionally speaking i know they have a a rule for the size of the label that's used on various different products and so maybe that's a way you can you can yeah, also check yeah, somewhat and you know, I think that in the case of examples that they they brought to our attention, I couldn't tell because they didn't have it in front of the actual product, but it almost looked like they embroidered it onto the garment. Which so everybody should know, the SFI is a patch. It's a separate patch that is then sewn onto the garment, and in the patch, whether it's a, a fire suit or shoes or gloves or whatever, different types of patches, but it's an actual patch that's sewn on. So that would be one sure giveaway. If you were to buy a, a suit, you know, and it looks like it's embroidered onto the under the suit, then that's a no go. That's that's not an SFI uh, supply patch there. And sometimes the quality of the patch. And again, in the examples that that I saw, the images of it was pretty shoddy. You could tell that it's not a that's why it was pretty crisp, pretty clean. You know, good good embroidery work, good good patch work. Um, in the, the example shown or not, not very clean, the, the lettering is really blotchy and things like that. So it, it matched the quality of the rest of the garment. <laughs> yeah, and so for um, anybody who's interested interested in reading the Road and Track article, I did put a link in um, earlier in the comments section that'll take you to that, um, to that article that they wrote. And again, I wanna um, give a big shout out to Wendy Moretz who is the one who sent that link to the article over to us. Um, Wendy is a, a Kenny Brown customer. She uses our suspension on her race car. She's gotten back into racing this year, and I think she's had some some pretty good success. So we're so excited to, to see her on track. Wendy has, um, is a longtime instructor for several different um, driving groups, and um, and we're, we're so pleased to see that she's, she's getting back on track now. So, and good luck to Wendy for the rest of the season. Uh, let's yeah. see, do we have any more questions here? Well, we, we did have Jorge, um, he's uh, viewing today on YouTube and I his question was basically the same as Joe's, what are the helmets that are, um, let's see, how did he, are tethered or have neck neck protection? And I guess that's, that's pretty much all of the helmets for the most part that impact cells. Or uh, yeah, other other than some of the uh, over the wall crew helmets, but that's a different different animal. Um, yeah. And the uh, recreational DOT helmets that we manufacture, like DTV market recreational, just things like that. Um, one one more thing regarding the the counterfeiting thing, and I think it's it, and not to knock these types of companies, but it's kind of a red flag if you see a manufacturer you've never heard of before on some of these very popular. Uh, online marketplaces, that, that's probably, you, you want to really investigate that, that, that product that way. Um, a lot of stuff comes from overseas in their, their uh, because they can't sell them through your traditional distributors and dealers because they just won't sell that stuff. And most part, these any reputable ones won't. Um, so they tend to sell this through these online marketplaces. So that's, that's kind of a red flag right there. I see something's incredibly cheap and I've never heard of these guys and, you know, uh, then, and then they're not available anywhere else or any of the larger reputable dealers. And, and we all know who those are. I won't go down the, the names because I'll miss somebody and get yelled at, but uh, there are a lot of reputable dealers out there uh, that sell our product and others. 
And so that's probably the first place that you really should, you know, look and consider is, is supporting one of our you know, great U.S.-based dealers um, uh, in, in looking to improve the U.S.-based uh, tech products or manufacturers. You know, that that's going to help right there. But but again, regardless of whatever it is, whoever product it is, um, if you really want to know, just again, go to SFI or FI and, and do a uh, manufacturer search and they'll you can find out right away whether they've been homologated or not. Okay, uh, Brad, are you ready to announce the winner of the Impact Racing Dragon Glass? I am, yeah. Okay. Do you want me to announce it? Yes, of course. You, you said you knew who it was. Yeah, I know who it is, and I think he knows too. So the, <laughs> the winner of the Impact Glove giveaway is Speed Therapy Academy alumni member Jay Myers from Buffalo, New York. And so congratulations, Jay. Yay, congratulations, Jay. Wonderful. So it, pay, it, pay, it pays to be the, the early bird in this scenario. So you were, you were the first person that um, commented. And uh, so today's your lucky day. So there that's, we go. That's great. Thank you again, Ben, for offering those gloves. Um, I'm sure Jay will enjoy those. Let's see. I'm going to squeeze in here so we can yeah. see each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, get kind of cozy here. Uh, let's see. We So this is the end of our show. We really appreciate you, uh, Ben, being on again. Uh, everybody always enjoys you so much. Well, like I said, we get requests for you all the time. So and thank you for showing all the products. I appreciate that. Um, the other thing I wanted to announce is, Brad, do you have a verification on who's going to be here in two weeks live? Steve Turner? Um, I do not yet. Um, Steve okay. is at an NMRA race this weekend, so he has verbally committed. I saw him last weekend in Daytona Beach for the uh, Mustang show that they had here. And um, so, he, so he's interested. I think that he's going to be our special guest in two weeks, which will be August something or other. Um, stay tuned for that. Next weekend, we will be doing a replay of uh, Cars and Coffee with Kenny episode six. Um, there's some great information in there about learning a new uh, racetrack for the first time and, and things like that. So we look forward to that encore. Uh, replay. And then uh, the following week, we hope to have Steve Turner, who's a freelance um, editor. Now he's been in the he's been in the publishing industry for 20 plus years, uh, knows Kenny really well. Um, they did a lot of track days together and um, and he's a he's a wealth of knowledge. So um, we look forward to that. If plans change, then um, I will be sure to let you know. And you've probably read many of the articles and seen many, much of the photography that he's taken over the years. So uh, that will be a good one. And the, the next live show is the first weekend in August. So join us then. Obviously, uh, watch Kenny uh, next weekend, too. Um, the uh, one thing I wanted to mention on a personal note, uh, many of you that have been with the program for quite a while know that Kenny is a huge scotch connoisseur. In fact, he has, I think, close to 100 bottles of single malt scotch, if not more. Yeah. I should show you that. that. And uh, this Wednesday is Nash, our International Scotch Day. So um, he always loves to celebrate that. So if you think about it, uh, have a wee dram and a toast to him uh, this coming Wednesday for National Scotch Day. Uh, great program, and we look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.